You know, I say this so often, but man, it's good to serve God. Isn't it good to serve God? And I've been praying a lot, um, a lot. And the question is, what do you want most from life? You know, and so I just want to encourage you to think about what do you want? Do you want money? Do you want friendship? Do you want relationships? Or do you want to know the Lord deeper and more? And so I've been praying, Lord, just let us get to know you more. Let us get to know your presence, Father. Come and move in this, in this place when we're here. Just come and start touching people, Lord, and just heal people and set people free. So that's what I'm believing for this year. I'm believing we're going to see a lot of that. And so I just want to say there's a lot of new faces. It's so nice to see Andrew and it's Mick, and so you're welcome. So nice to see you guys again. And, um, Mick from Bolivia is here, so if you guys wanted to catch up with him afterwards, have a chat to Jeff, or he'll be at the back for coffee. But it's so nice to see you, mate. It's good to have you here. Nice to have your parents here as well. So, uh, Can I just pray? I, just, I know a lot of people are taking, going through a lot of tough times, and so I just feel led to pray. So Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you're always there. Thank you, Father, that nothing catches you by surprise. Thank you, Lord, that even though we're surprised and even though sometimes, Lord, we're shocked and we don't know what to do, Lord, but you're never surprised. You always know. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord, today a special blessing on everyone here. I pray, Father, as we just share your word that you speak to people's hearts. Father, I pray where miracles are needed, Lord, that you will do what you do best, Father. You've come to seek and save those who are lost and set the captives free. And so, Father, we just pray that this morning. I pray, Lord, not only for the service, Lord, but for today and, and this week and next week, Lord, and next month, Father, and, and six months' time, Lord, I just pray that you lead us and guide us. And Lord, I just pray that you meet every need, Lord. We bring every need to you here this morning, Father, and I know there's deep needs. And so, Father, I pray and ask in Jesus' name that you meet every need according to your riches and according to your glory. Amen. Amen. I don't know who of you were here on Monday. I can't believe it was Monday that we were here already. So we did a Christmas service on Monday. And I just want to thank Karen and everyone involved. It was really blessed. And it was just such a nice way to, to spend the morning. And thanks for those of you who could join us. And I've been praying about today and saying, Lord, what, sh you know, what should I share? And I just thought, well, you know, Christmas is such a great season because at Christmas we sing carols. At Christmas we celebrate this baby called Jesus. And I know a lot of you have work, walked with the Lord and have served the Lord a long time, but I just felt in my heart this morning just to do a little service and just remind us, who is this Jesus that we celebrate? Who is this Jesus that we serve? You know, and we read a scripture like Luke 2 verse 11, and it says, Today in the town of Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You know, and that's not a story that you read. That's, that's a fulfillment of a promise. Sorry, and that's a promise that God made. God gave us a promise in the Garden of Eden. And God has fulfilled that promise through his son Jesus. And so it took about 4,000 years for that promise to come to pass. And I mean, we've looked at, often we've looked at Genesis 3.15. And you know, that scripture we see where God came and God made a promise. He said, okay, I'm going to do a few things. First, I'm going to... Send my son into the world to defeat your enemy, Satan. He's going to come through a virgin birth, and he's going to be your savior. And so God made us a promise, and he fulfilled that promise. And so we can sit here today, and we can be saved, and we can know the Lord because of that promise that he made. And Isaiah 7 verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you'll call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. And so God fulfilled that promise that he made all those years ago. And so the question is, who is this Jesus that we serve? Who is this little baby that we sing about at Christmas? Why did he come into the world? You know, about one third of the world's population, and they say that's about 2.5 billion people, they call themselves or they associate themselves as being Christians or knowing the Lord. About 1.5 billion people are Islam, and they believe that Jesus is just some prophet. And then the remaining 3.2 billion people have either heard or know about Jesus, but don't actually serve him or know him at all. And so that's a huge amount of people that just don't know the Lord. But when you look at the Bible, and I'll take you through a little bit of a Bible journey, the Bible tells us that Jesus was born to Jewish parents, and he was born in a small town called Bethlehem. 
And Bethlehem was just south of, south of Jerusalem. And when Jesus was born, um, Jerusalem and, and Bethlehem were under Roman rule. And so his parents then moved to a place called Nazareth, and Jesus grew up in Nazareth. And so that's why sometimes we refer to him as Jesus of Nazareth, because that's where he grew up. His father was a carpenter, and so, you know, as he grew up, I'm sure he learned the trade. And so until he was about 30, Jesus was a carpenter. And then at the age of 30, Jesus took his set of tools and he put them down, and he picked up another set of tools, the tools of ministry. And so at 30, Jesus put down one set and picked up ministry. And so he went into ministry for three years. And what he did is he then chose 12 disciples. And he chose the most ordinary people you can find. And that gives me hope. <laughs> I think, Lord, if you can use them, you can use me. And so God is amazing that he can use anybody. You know, God is not fussy. God loves you for who you are. And Catherine Kuhlman used to say something that I, that I love. She says, He's not looking for golden vessels. He's not looking for silver vessels. He's just looking for yielded vessels. And so as you yield yourself to the Lord, he can use anybody. Isn't that amazing? And so that's what he did. Jesus chose 12 disciples that he decided to use. But unfortunately, his teachings and his methodology was a little bit different. And so it started to startle some of the people. And Jesus started to offend a lot of people. But his message was so pure and his healings and his miracles were so undeniable that people started to follow this guy called Jesus. And they believed in this guy called Jesus. Um, so his popularity grew. Um, people started to worship him. And obviously that got the notice of the Jewish leaders at the time. And the Jewish leaders, they were very unhappy. They were jealous. They didn't like the fact that people were following Jesus. And in fact, they actually got to a point where they were threatened. And they thought, okay, well, Jesus is actually, what he's doing, he's threatening our traditions and our ceremonies. And so what they did is they decided that they'd, they'd um, get the Romans and what they would do is they would betray him and kill him. And so that's what they did. They decided to kill the, the, the man we sing about, Jesus. But you know, that's not the end of the story. The amazing thing is with Jesus' death, that the story doesn't end there. That's actually the beginning of the story because it's through his death, his burial and resurrection that you can be born again. It's through his death, his burial, and his resurrection that you can have victory over the enemy. It's through his death, burial, and resurrection that you can have eternal life. And so that's for us where it started. It started because Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament and he gave us the New Testament with his death. And then uh, three days later they went and they found that his tomb or his grave was empty and that he'd actually appeared to many people in different locations at the time before he went to heaven. And so I just got a little um, reading there that I'll read you. It came out of the canons of historical research. And it goes like this. It says, They conclude that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was actually empty on the morning of the first Easter. No shred of evidence has yet been discovered in literary sources, epigraphy, and that is just the study of inscriptions and old inscriptions, no evidence has been found in archaeology that would disprove this statement. So they have not been able to prove that Jesus did not rise on the third day. And then the Encyclopedia Britannica, the latest version, actually has got 20,000 words on this person, Jesus. And not once does it ever deny or say that he didn't exist. Isn't that amazing? And then I found a story of a gentleman called Dr. James Annual Francis and Ellen Francis, and he was a pastor and an author. And I'm just going to ask teens to read this for you. And so he wrote, he wrote something, and he called it "One Solitary Life." And so he's, this is how he sees the life of Jesus. <clears throat> Sorry, it's, it's it's written a little bit like a poem, and it goes like this. It says, "He was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman." He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. Then, for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never had a family or owned a home. He never set, in foot, set foot inside a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He never wrote a book or held office. He did nothing. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies. 
He went through the mockery of a trial and he was nailed to a cross between two thieves while he was dying. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the one piece of property he had, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today he, Jesus, is still the central figure for much of the human race. All of the armies that ever marched, all of the navies that ever sailed, and all of the parliaments that ever sat, and all of the kings that ever reigned, all put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Thanks, love. That's beautiful. It just says so much. And in just that writing, I'm thinking, man, you don't even have to preach. You can just stand up here and just read that. That's beautiful. Um, and then I found a, a saying by Napoleon Bonaparte. And he actually said, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ was no mere man. Between him and whoever else there is in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. And so that was Napoleon. And so most religions see Jesus as either a prophet He's a great teacher or he's a godly man. But the Bible tells us something different. The Bible tells us that Jesus was more than a prophet. He was more than just a teacher and he was more than a godly man. He was a son of God and he was both fully man and fully God. Amen. And so the next question we can ask ourselves, so we know who he is, but why did he come? Why did Jesus come to this earth? It would have been better just to stay in heaven. Um, so John 6 verse 38 Jesus says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And so Jesus came on behalf of the Father. Jesus came because God sent him to earth because he loves us so much. And so Jesus came. The first thing he did is he came to seek and save those that are lost. Luke 19.10 says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And so man fell in the Garden of Eden, and Jesus came to restore man back to God. And so that's why he came. He came to restore us so you and I can sit here and we can have a relationship with this almighty God. 1 John 3.8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the second thing Jesus came to do is he came to defeat our enemy. He came to give us victory. He came to give us authority. He came so that you and I can walk in everything he's made available to us. So not only did he come to restore us back to heaven, but he came to give us victory so we can walk in authority over principalities and powers. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in the body, on his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came, in the world, came into the world to save sinners. And so not only did he do what we've just spoken about, but he came in the world so that you and I could be forgiven, that you and I... You know, when you've down, when you've missed it, when you've sinned, with whatever, you can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And you can repent. And God is so amazing that he'll wash your sin away and forget it. And so that's why he came. He came for you and for me. And he came because we were sinners. John 3, 16. I've just got to read that scripture because it's one we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so he came to forgive us, but he came to give us more. So we have eternal life. So one day when we pass, we can go to be with him in heaven. And so that's an incredible promise. That's the hope. Then Jesus died and he went into heaven and he says he will return. So he's coming back. And the Bible tells us that Jesus comes back twice. The first time he comes back, Jesus doesn't come to the earth. He comes to the he comes to capture the church away, and he comes to take everyone who's ever known him and served him and served God to be with him. And that's 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 to 17. I'll just read verse 16 onwards. It says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, the trump call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds, so to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And so Jesus is coming back. He's coming back for us. And we just don't know when. But we need to be ready. The next time Jesus comes back, and you can read about that in Jude 14 and 15 and Zechariah 
verses 14 and verse 4, it says, on the day that he comes back the second time, he comes to defeat our enemy, Satan. He comes to defeat the Antichrist. And it says that on the day he will stand on the Mount of Olives. And so when Jesus comes to the earth to defeat our enemy, we come back with him. And so that's, what he's, that's something we can look forward to, you know, and that's, that's an incredible thing. Jesus is a founder of the church, and we sang a song today about, you know, that um, the gates of hell will not prevail against the, the church and the, and the gates of God. And today, he stands at the right hand of God, and he's a high priest, and he's praying for you, and he's praying for me. In Hebrews 14, verses 4 and 11, it says, Therefore, since we have a high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that you and I have been tempted. Isn't that amazing? We have one who did not sin. Therefore, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time and need. And so when we've missed it, when we fall short, you know, when you've had a day and you say something maybe you shouldn't, or you, you, know, you, you say something to the driver that cut in front of you, you could just repent and go to the Lord and say, I had a tough day. Jesus knows what you're going through. You know, and that's the amazing thing. I, I was thinking something, I did something yesterday, and I said to, my, I said to the Lord, you know, you've, you've, I, was, I think I was, putting on my shoes or my socks and I said Lord you had to do what I've done he's done the same thing you know he had to go to the toilet like all of you he had to eat like all of you he drank and so he's experienced everything that you and I do and so when we fall short or when we're feeling glum you can go to him and he knows and he can sympathize because he's been where you and I have been amen and so what's in that name Jesus Christ why do we see Jesus Christ throughout the Bible well, Jesus is the Greek rendering of the Hebrew Yeshua, and it means he shall save. And so Jesus, as we saw, Jesus came to save and seek and save those who are lost. And we talk about Jesus Christ, and a lot of you, I'm sure you know, Christ is not Jesus' surname. <laughs> like Peter Van Heerden is my, Van Heerden is my surname. Jesus Christ, Christ is not Jesus' surname. Christ actually comes from the word um, Christos, and it comes from the verb creo, and it means to anoint. And so when, you, when you're talking about Jesus Christ, you're talking about, you can either say Jesus is the Messiah because he's the anointed one, or you could say Jesus the anointed one, or you could even say Jesus the anointed one with his anointing. And so that's who we serve. We serve Jesus who's been anointed by God to do everything we tell, we're reading about, and he's anointed to be there for you and for me. And so we're blessed that we serve a God who's anointed. Amen. And we can partake and we can also have access to that anointing from God. And so that's really a blessing. And I just thought I'd put a few other facts about this man, Jesus. So firstly, Jesus, as we know, he can foresee the future. And I've used the scripture before in John 14, 14 29, that before his death, he said to the disciples, I tell you now before it happens... So that when it does happen, you will believe. And so that's so God, Jesus foresees the future, but not only that, but he wants us to believe. And he's told us stuff in the word. That's what prophecy is. He's told us these things so that we may believe. The other thing about Jesus is he is eternal. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and him in, in him... All things hold together. And so Jesus has always been there. Micah 5 verse 2 says, Whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And you remember when Jesus was on, on earth, and he's, in John 8 58, he says, Before Abraham was born, I am. And so he wasn't just saying, just before Abraham was born, I was there. He's basically saying, I am. I am. I've always been here. I've existed throughout time. I've existed for eternity. And Revelation 1.8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, who is to come in Almighty. And so this is the Jesus that we worship. This is the one that we sing about, that he's always been there. So he knows the things you and I are going through. He knows the outcomes. He knows what we're going through and how to walk in victory. 
The other thing about Jesus is he's self-existent. He's a self-existent one. God is self-existent. And it's a scripture we all know, John 1, verse 1 to 3. It says, in the beginning was a word. The word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God, God in the beginning. And then look what it says in verse 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And so, you know, he's key to everything, isn't he? He's just, and that's why we worship him. That's why we sing carols and that's why we celebrate his birth. So Jesus is also omniscient. And omniscient means he knows everything. And um, in John 2, 25, they're saying he did not need any testimony about mankind for he knew what was each, in each person. And so while you're sitting here, Jesus knows what you're going through. Jesus knows your struggles. Jesus knows your need. Jesus knows what happened last week. You know, he knows stuff about you that no one else knows. And he's there and he wants to help you and he wants to be there for you. And I want to encourage you not to run away from him, but run to him. He's also omnipotent. And so that means he has unlimited power. And so in Matthew 9, verse 6, we see that Jesus has the power to forgive sin. In Matthew 28, verse 18, he has all the power in heaven and earth. In Luke 8, 25, he has power over nature. In John 10, verse 18, he has power over his own life. He says, I lay my life down to take it up again. In John 17, 2, he has power to give eternal life to others. In Mark 1, 29, 20, 34, he has power to heal the sick. He has power to raise the dead, and he can also cast out demons. In Philippians 3, verse 21, he has the power to transform a body. And in Colossians 1, verse 16, it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created. Isn't that amazing? Hey, in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him for him. And so that just, Karen and, and Tina were saying you know, earlier, just this year, just go into this year knowing, so this is who you serve. This is not a, just a Jesus in a book that you read about that gathers dust. This is someone who loves you and wants to help you, and he's there for you. Amen. He's also omnipresent, and that means... He's at the same place. He can be everywhere at the same time. And I think that would be a great skill to have, especially for your kids. Um, so Jesus is omnipresent. So he can be where you need him to be. And you, you're never too far from him. So whether you're singing in the shower, whether you're cutting the grass, whether you're stuck somewhere, he's always there. You can rely on him. The Bible tells us that he's immutable. And that means he never changes. And so... His character doesn't change. It's not talking about his mind, his character. The character of God is unchangeable and will never change. And Hebrews, 1, Hebrews 13, 8 says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so that means we can count on him. When we need him, he's there. You know, he doesn't change and suddenly say, oh, you know, uh, Carrie, no, I can't be there today. I'm busy. I've got an appointment. He'll always be there for you. He'll be there for us. And the last thing is he is sovereign. Matthew 28, verse 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And 1 Peter 3, 22 says, He has gone into heaven and is at the Father's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And so that's who we celebrate this morning. So that's who we should go into the new year, new year saying, Okay, Lord, this is who I serve. You're, these are all the things that you are, and yet you've chosen me. You love me. You come to save me. And, you know, and we, should be, we should be blessed, we should feel encouraged and say, Lord, you know, that's who you are. You know, and so we're not, you know, we, are, we are soldiers in the army of God. You know, and you should all have swords and shiny shields and be ready to fight because you serve the mightiest of all. Amen. And so before I finish today, I just want to play a little video for you. And then after the video, I'm just going to lead us in the Lord's sinner's prayer. And hopefully the video will work. Let's see. There you go. Jesus claimed to be. Who does the Bible say he is? First, he is God in the flesh. Jesus said in John 10.30, I and the Father are one. At first glance, this might not seem to be a claim to be God. However, look at the Jews' reaction to his statement. 
they tried to stone him for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. The Jews understood Jesus' statement as a claim to be God. In the following verses, Jesus never corrects the Jews or attempts to clarify his statement. He never says, I did not claim to be God. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he truly was claiming equality with God. In John 8:58. Jesus claims pre-existence, an attribute of God. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. In response to this statement, the Jews again took up stones to stone Jesus. In claiming pre-existence, Jesus applied a name for God to himself, I am. The Jews rejected Jesus' identity as God incarnate, but they understood exactly what he was saying. Other biblical clues that Jesus is God in the flesh include John 1.1, which says, The Word was God, coupled with John 1.14, which says, The Word became flesh. Thomas, the disciple, declared to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus does not correct him. The Apostle Paul describes Jesus as our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter says the same, calling Jesus our God and Savior. God the Father bears witness of Jesus' identity as well. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. Old Testament prophecies, such as Isaiah 9-6, announce the deity of Christ. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Why is the question of Jesus' identity so important? Why does it matter whether Jesus is God? Several reasons. First, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, if Jesus is not God, then Jesus is the worst of liars and untrustworthy in every way. If Jesus is not God, then the apostles would likewise have been liars. Jesus had to be God because the Messiah was promised to be the Holy One. Since no one on earth is righteous before God, God himself had to enter the world as a human. If Jesus is not God, his death would have been insufficient to pay the penalty for the sins of the whole world. Only God himself could provide an infinite, eternally valuable sacrifice. God is the only Savior. If Jesus is to be the Savior, then he must be God. Jesus had to be both God and man. As God, Jesus could satisfy God's wrath. As a man, Jesus had the capability of dying. As the God-man, Jesus is the perfect mediator between heaven and earth. Salvation is only available through faith in Jesus Christ. As he proclaimed, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Isn't that lovely? Hey, I thought I'd play that little snippet and I thought that's just special because that sums up who we serve. And so I just wanted to say before we go into the new year, um, Just refocus and just go into the new year knowing who it is that we serve, knowing that he's on your side, knowing that he cares for you, knowing that he loves you. And sure, we've got tough times. Sure, we go through times that we don't understand, but he never leaves or forsakes us. And so this morning before we close, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, you know, if you've maybe moved away from the Lord or maybe you've never asked the Lord into your life or maybe you haven't been where you are with the Lord or maybe that question, and maybe if I can ask the worship team to come up at this time. You know, maybe you can ask the question, what do I want most? And so my question to you today is, what do you want most out of life? Is it, is it money? Is it a nice car, a nice house? Or do you want to know that you, your life is with the Lord? Do you want to know that where you're going? Do you want to be part of it? When Jesus comes back in the air, do you want to be one of those that meets with him in the air? And so this is a great opportunity just to reassess your life and say, Lord, and also, if you, if you just find that you've maybe strayed from the Lord, or you're not as close to the Lord as you should be, this is a good opportunity just to recommit yourself to the Lord. And so if I could just ask this morning as I just lead us in this prayer, if, if that's you and you, you just feel you need to, Lord, just I need a fresh touch from you, or if you, maybe you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you know, if I can just ask that we all just close our eyes and just bow our heads. And, you know, if that's you and you, you're saying, Lord, I just want more of you. I want but, uh, maybe just raise your hand briefly and then just put it down again. And then even, even um, you know, even if you don't want to raise your hand, but you feel in your heart, then I just want you to follow me and just 
I'll just lead you in this prayer. If you can just say it loud after me. Oh God, I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for my sins. Today I want to turn away from my sins and wrongdoing. I believe Jesus is your son. And I believe he died on the cross for me. And today I place my faith in Jesus as my Savior. And I confess him as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. And so I really just want to encourage you, have a good new year. Go into the new year on fire for God. And um, I shared a message two weeks ago, and it says, you know, leaving those things that are in the past behind and those things that have held us back those things that have kept us back those things that have dragged you down leave them behind you as you go into the new year and go forward with the Lord and let the Lord show you the plans He has and the purposes He has for you because He's got a lot of stuff that He wants to do Amen and so we'll just close the service and then we can just uh, close with the worship song so Father we just thank you for today thank you Father for your presence thank you Father for your word thank you Jesus that you came to seek and save those who are lost you came to give us life you came to defeat the enemy Father all these things that you've done and I just pray let that be a reality let that be real in every heart Lord I pray and Lord I just pray for a change this year that something new happens I pray Father for a fresh touch a fresh anointing I pray God that you, you pour out a freshness in our hearts and the hearts of your people and Lord where things have been dead and dull and boring I pray God just bring excitement ignite ignite hearts Father and I just pray bring a change that brings life and excitement to everyone here and we thank you for that Father and we praise you for it Jesus Amen